Thank you. Please be seated. We'll go on the record in the matter of State of Utah versus Martin McNeil. He is present with his counsel. The state's attorneys are also present. Ms. Willis is on the stand. We are outside the presence of the jury. Ms. Willis, can I have you step down and come to the podium with your legal counsel? Counsel, would you state your appearance for the record? John Easton with Ms. Willis. Thank you. Ms. Willis, you have a Fifth Amendment privilege not to incriminate yourself. You have legal counsel that has advised you about that privilege. Is that correct? That is correct. While counsel can give you advice about that privilege, whether you choose to exercise it must be your own decision. It's anticipated that on, cross, on direct examination, you will be asked whether or not you gave false information to a police officer in the context of a criminal investigation. The answer to that question may give rise to criminal liability. If you are asked that question, do you intend to exercise your Fifth Amendment privilege or not? Not. You will not exercise the privilege? No. You intend to give answers to the question? Yes. Is this an issue of uh, immunity? I think from a technical point of view, she would invoke, but we were granting her a very limited use immunity today. Okay. Sense, Counsel, does she intend to exercise the privilege? Her intention is to testify truthfully. Her intention was to cooperate uh, with all aspects of the investigation and testify truthfully. The state has granted her use immunity uh, regarding prosecution for any false statement she made in the interview in October 2010, the interview conducted at the Texas prison. We have accepted that, and our intention is to testify and go forward with direct examination. Very good. Uh, has the immunity agreement been reduced to writing? It has. Have you received a copy? We have received an original. I'd like to make that a part of the record in this case as well. You may. Is there anything further today? Very good. If you'll retake the witness stand, let's have the jury in. Thank you. Please be seated. We're on the record in the matter of State of Utah versus Martin McNeil. The jury is now seated. Counselor present. Mr. McNeil is present. Ms. Willis is on the witness stand. You may continue your examination. You may. Back to this interview from uh, October 11, 2010. Um, and I asked you to read this section. And um, do you remember this? Yes. And isn't it true that you told investigators that 
you could not see yourself being with Martin any further, and the idea of being with him terrified you. I found myself in prison for two years as a result of being with this guy, and that was terrifying. <laughs> One last letter. This is, you look at this one. What's the date on this one? This is October 8th, excuse me, November 8th, 2010. And how is it addressed? Dear one. And who is the dear one? I am. And it's written by whom? Martin. Okay. You read that line? I received a letter from you on Friday that was written on October 17th. Fair to say October 17th comes after October 10th. That's correct. So you wrote him a letter after your interview with authorities, correct? That's correct. After the interview where you said the relationship was basically over. The relationship was over after prison, after jail. I needed his support during that time. I'd never had anything but a speeding ticket up to that point, and I was terrified. Will you read this line for me? Um... I would like to buy one and have one in our home library. Do you know what he's talking about here? Uh, it says this, prior to that, it says this is the only book I've read here that I would like to have and buy for the home library. Okay. So he's, he's read a lot of books, right? Yes. And, and shared that with you. And here he says he would like to have it in our home library, intimating a future with you. Yes. Right? You read that line. I would love to take you back to Rome and then travel throughout the rest of Italy. Okay, thank you. So by saying he received your letter at this, is it fair to say that in that letter you didn't tell him things were over and you were still communicating to each other in terms of endearment and such? We did until I was out of jail, yes. I think it was in February of um, 2011. Okay. And um, after you were released, you still received some benefits from the defendant, correct? No. You didn't drive a car? That was, well, I wouldn't say that was from him. Was it that was, that was from my pre That was from, from my previous life there. Okay, and, and you, you got this car back after you got out? Yes. What kind of a car was this? It was a BMW. I'm going to take you back a little bit. There are a couple of things I want to follow up with on uh, your earlier testimony. Um, isn't it true that in March of 2007, you were made aware that Michelle was going to have surgery? I believe so, yeah. You remember that? Um, what day did you find out that Michelle died? I found out on the 11th in the afternoon. April 11th of 2007. And how did you find that out? From a text. <coughs> From whom? Objection, Your Honor. This has been asked and answered. Um, overruled, she may answer. A text from whom? From Martin. Okay. And then, <clears throat> and it's, it's true that after that, you took pictures of yourself and sent them to him on the 12th. I guess so. I, it's been too long, but we've seen that evidence. Ms. Willis, isn't it fair to say that you appear to be minimizing your relationship with the defendant? I don't believe so. me asking you a question about a bunch of facts and then I asked you if you knew um, anything else about Michelle's death and your answer was no correct I don't, I don't rem Maybe remember that was the a specific phrased question I brought up a bunch of things that were all kind of lined up with each other and I said 
are you telling us you don't know anything else about Michelle's death? And you said, yeah, I don't know anything else, right? You have been lining up facts this whole trial. I'm not sure which time you refer to. Can you refresh my memory? Okay, well, let me, I'll move on from that, but. Fair to say you are protective of Martin? Martin and I have not been in a relationship for years and years. I... Your Honor, I'm going to move to strike. It's not responsive. Uh, it's a yes or no question. The no. motion to strike is granted. The answer is no? The answer is no. That's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you. You may cross. <coughs> um, as well as I just have a few questions. Um, do you intend to have a relationship with Martin in the future? No. And um, how long has your relationship been over with him? Uh, I haven't spoken to him in four and a half years on the phone. I saw him twice in court in the last four and a half years. Okay, have you continued writing letters to him? Not since I was released from jail. You're receiving letters from him? No. Are you in a, another relationship at this time? Yes. Um, the prosecutor brought up these pictures, and he showed you a bunch of pictures of yourself. Yes. Um, there were more. There were four pictures sent on April 11th. Isn't that correct? I believe. April 12th, 2007. I, I believe so. Okay, but there were more created than were sent on that day. And the prosecutor just sent you pictures that were created on April 12th, 2007. Correct. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? They were created on that date, but they weren't necessarily sent on that date. I think that is true. Okay. And none of these pictures um, showed your breasts? No. They were mostly just of your face? That's correct. And then there was one picture of your back, correct? Yes. And you're not sure that you even sent that picture of your back on April 12th, Objection, 2007? Uh, overruled. I, I don't have any idea when these pictures were sent. I remember taking them. I remember seeing them. I don't specifically remember sending them that day. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Any redirect? I have no redirect, Your Honor. Any questions for this witness, if you would pass them to the end of the row? Counsel, will you approach? When did you and the defendant obtain the marriage license? Um, it was in the summer of 2007, uh, approximately the end of July, August, Do July, have, beginning of August. I'm sorry. Do you have follow-up questions? Yes, sir. You may. Yes. And so what date was it? That was the end of July, 20th day of July, 2007. Okay. And this looks familiar as the one you applied for? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Your Honor, we, we don't uh, oppose her being released from her subpoena at this point. Any objection? objection? You will be released from your trial subpoena. Thank you. 
Your Honor, may counsel and I approach briefly? You may. Does the state intend to call more witnesses? We do not, Your Honor. With the record that was briefly made um, with Your Honor at the bench, the state's resting at this point. Thank you. Does the defense intend to call witnesses? Here you are. Very good. We will call Jim Van Zandt. <coughs> Mr. Van Zandt, if you will come forward here to the clerk's desk, please raise your right hand and be sworn. Thank you. If you'll be seated here. Would you state your name for the record, please? Jim W. Van Zandt. And uh, in what city do you reside? Lehigh. And you where, where are you employed? At the Utah State Developmental Center in American Fork. And how long have you been employed there? Uh, continuously since 1990. I worked previously there all going through school, but I uh, came back in 1990. In 2007, uh, what were your job responsibilities? Um, then and now, I'm a family nurse practitioner. I provide medical care for the people that live there. And in the course of, of your job, did you have occasion to associate with, with my client, Mr. Martin McNeil? Yes. And uh, what was the nature of that association? Uh, Martin was my uh, immediate supervisor, and he was the clinical director of the developmental center at that time. And in um, April of uh, uh, 2007, uh, was there any practice amongst medical personnel in relation to um, clothing uh, uh, to be worn? Um, all of the practitioners, that was uh, Martin, myself, and the other two nurse practitioners wore uh, a knee-length um, white lab coat. Did you observe Mr. McNeil wearing that, that lab coat at work? Yes. Uh, would, he, how, would he wear it every day or? Pretty consistently, yes. And do you recall April 11th of 2007? Some of the details, yes. Okay. Uh, do you recall having any interaction with Mr. McNeil on that day? Yes, I do. What do you recall? <clears throat> We had two interactions uh, that day. The first one was um, um, as he was um, leaving to pick up his kindergartner from her morning um, kindergarten uh, about uh, a block or two away from the developmental center. And um, we, we talked in the, uh, in the hallway. We ran into each other there, and uh, he told me that he was on his way to uh, pick her up and it generally and all of us would generally try to touch bases with each other when we were leaving and coming and um, we uh, discussed that and, and he left. Uh, did you notice anything unusual about um, his demeanor when uh, when you had that discussion? No. Do you know approximately what time that would have been? Uh, I did not look at the clock. It was uh, a reasonable time to go pick up a kindergartner from half day, uh, um, nothing stood out to me as being in a, in a different time. And uh, did, what was the nature of your second interaction? It was um, 
later, uh, I was uh, working at my desk and uh, my uh, landline uh, phone rang and it was Martin. He's uh, obviously quite in <clears throat> distressed or in a hurry or in a panic perhaps. Um, and he told me that he was doing a code on his wife. And how much later was that second interaction from the first interaction? I, I can't really say. What, was it a fairly short time? Um, it was within an hour or two, I would say. I don't know. It could have been even shorter. Uh, I would, somewhere in that region, I can't say. And are you familiar with uh, Martin's office? Yes. And uh, from your um, experience, was it uh, common for anybody else to, to enter his office and use the telephone? No one would have it. No, it was not. No one would have any need to do that. We have phones all up and down the hallway, and no one would do that that I can think of any reason why that would take place. Are you familiar with the, the Heather building on the Developmental Center campus? Yes. And uh, have you had occasion to, uh, uh, to determine the, the length of time that, that it would take you to walk from the administration building where we're, well, let me strike that, Your Honor. In which building on the Developmental Center campus would would your office be located? We're in the medical, I'm in the medical building, um, which is about a two and a half minute walk from my office, which was just down the hall from Martin's office to um, um, the Heather building, which is where our human resources and a lot of our training takes place. Okay, so, so for clarification, uh, was Martin's office in the same medical building as, as yours? Yes. just. A couple doors, one, two, three, four doors down on the same hallway. And, and have you had occasion to determine how long it would take to walk from the medical building to the Heather building? About two and a half minutes. That's all the questions I have. You may cross. Okay, if I call you Jim. Yes, that's is that fine. your preference. Pardon me. Is that your preference, or? Yes, Jim is fine. On the second occasion, the defendant called you and he said his wife was in a like a code situation. Correct. He says he was performing a code on his wife. And you said. Um, Previously, the investigator, there was uh, no nonsense about his voice. None. And that he was totally coherent. Yes. You could understand everything he was saying. Um, he was um, very distressed, and that was obvious. I mean, the only thing I have to go by is his voice and if the way it came across. the words that were coming out of his mouth. I could. <clears throat> and you uh, didn't you tell uh, investigators that people who do what we do can deal with life and death situations? People in general? People who do what you do professionally. I, I'm not sure what the question is. I'm sorry. Um, you worked together with the defendant in the medical division of correct. the developmental center. Yes. And you handled medical issues regularly, correct? Yes. You handled them together. You handled them individually, yes. correct? Yes. And you said to the investigator that people in, in our situation, I mean yourself and the defendants, know how to deal with life and death situations. Yes, we're trained to do that. and. We probably shouldn't be in it if we, in that field, if we don't know how to do that. Okay. Um, 
Did the defendant talk to you about what was going on with his wife around this time? Objection, Your Honor. Your Honor, I believe 611 allows me to go in in the mode of direct examination. Uh, I don't think it's beyond the scope of direct, although it's unclear because you said around about this time, and so I'm not sure if you can lay further foundation. Uh, around the time of Michelle's death, did you know what was going on with her? Um, I w was under the understanding that she had had some type of surgery. Okay. And did the defendant talk to you about that? Um, just that she had had some type of surgery, and uh, I didn't know what type of surgery it was and didn't think it was any of my business to ask if, if it wasn't offered. Sure. Um, did the defendant talk to you about any potential issues she was having with her health as it related to the surgery? N not at that time. Did he later talk to you about that? Yes, he did. And what was that in relation to? that she had hypertension, high blood pressure, and uh, that um, he had uh, taken her to, uh, or she had gone to uh, see an internal medicine specialist uh, before the uh, surgery to discuss that, did to have that evaluated. You, oh, I'm sorry to cut you off. And to have that evaluated. Okay. Did he tell you whether the internal medicine doctor told him that she w she was good to go for the surgery or not? I believe at one point he said that uh, uh, that she was cleared. Okay. If I remember the wording right, it was cleared. That he cleared her for the surgery? That she was cleared. Okay. What kind of clinical matters did the two of you deal with at the developmental center in terms of difficulty? Everything that um, um, a general practice deals with, with the exception of um, maternity issues, of course, um, um, everyday illness, everyday injuries, plus um, ch chronic illnesses, plus um, um, all the things that are unique to people who have a severe mental handicap which is the population that we served, which included a, a lot of seizure problems, a lot of falls, a lot of behavioral issues, a lot of psychiatric diagnoses. Um, yeah, as far as complexity, I think you were asking, uh, um, they range from very mild runny noses to uh, very complicated uh, cancer issues or uh, other, just about any chronic uh, illness issue, and then at times there would be um, uh, emergency issues where someone would have a uh, blocked airway or, or um, would become very ill from a pneumonia or an aspiration or um, okay. a heart problem. Or Is it fair to say this is a, a relatively difficult patient at times to deal with? Which patient? At the developmental center. The, the, the patients in general, uh, yes, very challenging because most of them can't tell you what's wrong with them. And so you're, you're pretty well go going by uh, your own skills instead of patient history, which is such an important part of, uh, of uh, treating anyone is the history. When the defendant called you, he used the word code? He did. Um, is that a common word that the, you and the other medical personnel at the developmental center used? Yes. And well, what is, well, go ahead. Okay, you, you added another word there before, and that we at the developmental center use. Um, I think code is a is, is a misused word a lot in, in the medical profession. Uh -huh. It can mean a lot of things. When I uh, was in emergency room. Uh, 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 employee, I would uh, uh, deal with uh, trauma one codes and cardiac codes, and, and that's a full-blown code where you do everything you can to recover the patient, uh, intubate, uh, give uh, emergency drugs, uh, IV, so on like that. We don't do those kind of things at the developmental center. However, two people, two medical practitioners, a nurse practitioner and a physician talking about a situation would use that term very 
commonly to if, if they were indeed involved in, in, in finding someone that w needed resuscitation. Okay. That would be a, a normal word to use, yes. And so a code could mean a lot of things, but your could mean life-saving procedures, it could mean CPR, et cetera. It's used in a lot of different ways. Um, it probably has uh, more limited meanings, meanings than the way it's actually used among in my profession. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so using it in a broad sense, yourself and the defendant handled code situations at the developmental center. We handled situations where someone needed resuscitating, where someone's airway had been, uh, they was choking, uh, they, uh, it was, uh, someone was down and an uh, unknown cause of them being down. Um, yes, we did. In um, doing resuscitation efforts, is there a particular issue that is most important at the developmental center? Well, almost always it's, it's airway um, in, in, in our population. There's other reasons why someone would uh, uh, be down and unresponsive, but uh, the vast majority would be um, either th they're very, very sick, uh, they come on quite suddenly from an aspiration pneumonia or other reasons, or they've choked on something. And so when you, let me make sure I understand this rightly as a layperson, when you say airway management, you're talking making sure, could you describe that for us? Well, f you know, you just do your, what we call the ABCs, airway breathing and, and uh, cardiac. But um, you, um, um, okay, someone's down and they're, they're not breathing. You've got to get them breathing. Uh, do they need a Heimlich maneuver? Uh, you inspect their mouth. Uh, uh, what color are they? Uh, do you need suction to get something out of their mouth, or do you need a Heimlich to get it out of their mouth? Or do you, uh, in in all of these cases, you know, we don't try to just deal with it there. The, the ambulance is called immediately, and and uh, but you were trained on right CPR. For example. That's correct. How were you trained on CPR? What are you supposed to do? Well, you, they've changed it just recently, but um, at that time it was an annual recertification. Every uh, person, every nurse, every doctor, uh, to my knowledge, has to, had to at that time re renew their certification by taking a, a CPR class. Okay, and how were you trained to actually manage the patient in terms of positioning? Well, you need to have the patient on a firm, uh, flat surface, and um, if you're if you're going to do chest percussions, um, you you have the uh, patient on a flat surface, and you lean over them, and you, uh, depending on what the situation and how much help you have, whether you've got another provider with you, you uh, give chest compressions at a certain amount of, uh, at a certain rate, and and um, give. Um, uh, breathing either through uh, a bag mask, a valve, or uh, uh, or a uh, uh, cover over their mouth, to, and to, to to protect your mouth from their secretions and and to blow into it, depending on what you know what's available to you at the time. As as a nurse practitioner and and with the defendant as the medical director while uh, he was working at the developmental center, um, did patients sometimes die? So, patients sometimes died. How were those deaths handled in terms of review? Um, there's... It is. Uh, Council, would you approach the bench, please?
The objection is sustained. I believe that's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Any uh, redirect for this witness? Have you ever seen Mr. McNeil be involved in a code situation with a family member? No. What time would you consider to be a normal time for a kindergartner to get out of a half day of school? An objective speculative. Uh, Sustain. You may lay further foundation if you can. In your in your uh, direct examination, you indicated that uh, when Mr. McNeil told you that he was leaving to pick up Ada, you consider that to be a a typical time uh, for a kindergartner to get out of a half day of school, but you didn't remember the time. And, and so, can you tell us what your idea of a normal time would be for a kindergartner to get out of a half day of School? Yeah, I've had seven kindergartners, and it varies on de depending on the school. And uh, between 11 and 12 is what I would consider an appropriate time. Anybody leaving to pick up their kindergartner between 11 and 12, I would consider that a normal time. And is that consistent with when you believe Mr. McNeil told you on April 11th of 2007 that that he was leaving to pick up his daughter Ada from kindergarten? Based on the on the context of the situation, yes. So you believed it was sometime between 11 and 12? Yes. In relation to the questions um, Mr. Pete asked you about CPR, you, you testified that uh, it's the, the proper practice to have somebody on a flat surface, correct? Y yes. If you can't get somebody on a flat surface, is it appropriate to still try and do the best you can? Yes, and I've seen situations where you have to do it where they're at without without having a flat, uh, soft surface. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Isn't it true you don't have a specific memory of the time that you spoke to the defendant about when he was going to pick up his kindergartner? I have a specific memory of a, the last interaction I had with him before I received the call telling me that his wife was in trouble that took place in the hallway of the medical hallway at a time that was just was reasonable for a parent to be picking up, going, leaving to pick up their daughter from kindergarten, half day kindergarten, uh, just a couple, couple of uh, 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 blocks away from where we were at. But again, you don't know exactly what time that was. I did not look at a watch or it clock. It could have been 11.15, it could have been 12, it could have been 11.45. I would think more earlier than later, but I'm not sure you're correct. You, you don't know, for sure. I know what I've testified. I don't right, know you anything don't know other. What time for sure, correct? I know it was uh, at a reasonable time to pick up a kindergartner from half day kindergarten. Okay. Um, how do you know it was half day kindergarten? Because I've never seen kindergarten that wasn't, and uh, and uh, that was my understanding uh, through our conversations Did you, that she um, was in kindergarten for half a day. Did you know what school she was going to? Um, I knew that um, it was either American Heritage or Lincoln, which are both very close. That's all I have. Thanks. Nothing further. Do you have questions for Mr. Van Zant? Please, will you approach council?
common practice for Mr. McNeil to call you about family medical issues? We discussed um, my family medical issues, his family medical issues, and it, it's just kind of a professional courtesy to, to bounce things off of each other and try and resolve uh, um, medical issues. Yes, we, we did um, do that on different occasions, back and forth. Thank you. Any additional questions? Not from the state. Very good. May Mr. Van Zamp be released from his trial subpoena or not? No objection. I don't object. <coughs> You may uh, be released from your trial subpoena, and which means you won't be called back. You may step down. Next. The defense calls Linda Strong. It's strong. Strong, yes. Strong. Ms. Strong. If you'll come right up here to the clerk's desk, please raise your right hand and take an oath. Thank you. If you'll be seated here, please. Morning, Ms. Strong. Could you state your name and spell your last name for the record, please? Linda Strong, S-T-R-O-N-G. And what is your profession? I am a kindergarten school teacher. Where do you teach school? At American Heritage School in American Fork. How long have you taught there? This is my 20th year. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Uh, did you ever teach a, an Ada McNeil? Yes, I did. Okay. Can you tell me when, when you taught her? Uh, 2006 to 2007. She was a kindergartner in your class? Yes. Was she in your class on April 11, 2007? Yes, she was. What time did kindergarten last for her that morning? 11.30. Okay. And was Ada present on April 11, 2007? Yes, she was. Do you know who came to get her that day? Her father, Martin. And what time did, did class get out that day? Uh, approximately 11.30. We dismiss at 11.30, and then the children get their backpacks, and we walk out to the front of the school. Okay, and how long does that take? I guess depending on the day, uh, up to five minutes. And Mr. McNeil picked her up that day? Yes. So he was there at a prop between 11.30 and 11.35 to pick up Ada? Yes. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Any cross from the state? Uh, maybe just one question. Go ahead. Ms. Strong, do you have a specific recollection of Mr. McNeil picking Ada up that day? Uh, yes, I do. I, um, yeah, yes, I do. You can see it in your memory, in yes, your mind. Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. Nothing further, Your Honor. Do you have questions for Ms. Strong? May she be released from her trial subpoena? Yes. No objection. Thank you. You're released. You may step down. Thank you. The defense calls Tammy Black. May we approach? You may.
Ms. Black, if you'll come forward here to the clerk's desk, please raise your right hand and be sworn. Thank you. If you'll be seated here. Good morning, Ms. Black. Good morning. Could you state your name and spell your last name for the record, please? Tammy Black, B-L-A-C-K. And, and where do you work, Tammy? I work for adult probation and parole for the Department of Corrections. Okay. Can you tell the jury what that is? I'm a probation officer. I'm ordered by the court to make the offenders do what the court has asked them to do. I make sure they do it. If they do it, they're supposed to. I report to the judge. If they do it, they're not supposed to. I report to the judge. Okay, I notice you're wearing a badge. Are you a police officer? Yes, I am. And you're certified at, at post? Yes, I am. Which is police officer standardized training? Yes. Okay. Category one police officer? Yes. Are you familiar with a Jason Poiret? I am. How do you know him? I supervised him. How long did you supervise him? From January 2011 to December 2012. How much contact did you have with Mr. Poiray during that period of time? By standards, which is how we decide how often we're seeing the offenders. Jason was a moderate, which meant I met with him every month in my office, and I attempted or did see him at least every 60 days in the field. Okay, how long were those meetings? Probably in the office, you're talking maybe five, six, seven minutes at a time. And what about in the field? What does that mean in the field, that you would have contact with him in the field? What that means is I can go to his place of employment or his home, or if I seen him in the community, that was one-on-one -on -one contact that I would document in the computer that I seen him or that if I went to his house and he was not home or did not answer the door, I would document that I attempted a field visit at his place of residence. How many times um, from January 2011 to December 2012 did you have contact with him in the community or in the field? Actual physical contact? Yes, when you actually saw him. I would have to guess without looking at my notes for sure, maybe maybe eight times, maybe more. I I know there were times that no one answered the door when we would go there. And can you describe some of that contact? You don't have to go into why you were there or your discussions, but can you kind of describe um, the situations where you went there? For example, to his home. Can you describe how many times you went to his home? I, without looking at my notes, I can't tell you for sure how many times I actually entered his home, but the first initial contact you make at the home, we would do a walkthrough of the residence, looking at the residence, looking at the layout, looking for things at the residence he shouldn't have, just trying to get a feel for what's going on with him. All right. What about um, outside of his home? Did you ever see him in the community or on the street or at his employment? I did actually see him one time at a store, um, and I, I'd given him, he had been in the office prior to that, and I'd given him a job contact lead for a forklift operator. And I do remember seeing him one time at the store, and he had been checking with that lead, but other than at his home or in my office, that's the only contact I had with him in the community. Okay. How long was that contact in the, in the store? Probably only a minute or two. Based upon your, your contact with Mr. Poi Ray, um, are you aware of his reputation in the community for truthfulness? Objection. Foundation. <coughs> Council, will you approach, please?
The objection uh, is sustained. That's all I have, Mr. Thank you. No cross, Your Honor. You may, uh, may she be released from her subpoena? Yes, Your Honor. Are there any questions from the jury? Uh, Otherwise, yeah. yes, the state doesn't object to her release. No questions. You may step down. Thank you. You may. Ladies and gentlemen, the defense intends to call an additional witness. Uh, that witness has been scheduled for 1 o'clock today, so we'll break for lunch until 1 o'clock. Please keep my prior admonition in mind. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. It's your duty not to form or express any opinion about how the case should be decided until it's finally submitted to you for deliberation. Do no research on your own. Avoid media coverage. If you'll be back at 1, please. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, Council, would you like to make any further record regarding the exclusion of the opinion testimony of Ms. Black? I would just indicate that uh, the state made an objection foundation because we don't believe an appropriate or sufficient foundation was laid for her to offer an opinion as to his reputation for truthfulness. And just to add, because of the, of the general community that was sustained. Yeah, my, as I stated at the bench conference, the the foundation established that Ms. Black met with the defendant once a month over about a two-year period, but those meetings were in the office. They didn't last longer than five to seven minutes. It's essentially a, a two-hour period that she spent time with him over two years. She did indicate she attempted contacts in the field on many occasions, that, but in many instances those were unsuccessful. In terms of field visits, she did a walkthrough with the offender the first time through his house, and then she referenced this store meeting that lasted not more than one to two minutes. Uh, in my view, the foundation is inadequate to allow her to render an opinion uh, as to reputation for uh, character for truthfulness. Her opinion, her, the, the rule permits uh, that to be 
either by reputation it's it's entitled reputation or opinion evidence a witness's credibility may be attacked or supported by testimony about the witness's reputation for having a character for truthfulness or untruthfulness or by testimony in the form of an opinion about that character. Uh, in my view, the foundation is clearly inadequate as to reputation um, and, and also inadequate as to the witness's ability even to render an opinion given her limited uh, contact with the individual whose credibility is being attacked. Um, would you like to take a break? We could re review some jury instructions. Or and before we do that, may, may we make our motion? Uh, yes, thank you. Go ahead. the close of the state's case, we approached the bench, and, and uh, rather than excuse the jury at that time, we received Your Honor's permission to, to make our, our motion on the record uh, for a directed verdict um, after we, we, we released the jury rather than contemporaneous. And, and so we would now like to, to make a, a, a formal motion for a directed verdict. Uh, I believe that uh, the standard for a directed verdict is set forth in the Utah Supreme Court case of State v. Montoya, 84 P. 3rd, 1183. It's a 2004 case and indicates that uh, a motion for a directed verdict made at the close of the state's case may be denied if the trial court finds that the state has established a prima facie case against the defendant by producing believable evidence of all the elements of the crime charged. And, and we would submit in this case that there has not been a prima facie case established based upon believable evidence to meet all of the elements of either of the crimes of obstruction of justice uh, or murder. Uh, in relation to obstruction of justice, uh, we, um, well, the, the defense filed a request for a bill of particulars in this case. Uh, the county also filed a, a summary, uh, a probable cause statement together with their information uh, in the case. And the response to the bill of particulars was that we set it all out in, in the probable cause statement, which Judge McVeigh uh, affirmed. And in the probable cause statement in relation to the obstruction of justice charge, uh, the state set forth five factors uh, that they thought supported that charge. One was that he removed Michelle's pants. Two, that he lied to a 911 dispatcher about performing CPR. Three, drained the tub. Four, lied about the position of Michelle's body in the tub to medical examiner and law enforcement. Five, disposed of remaining drugs prescribed to Michelle following surgery. When those factors um, are considered in relation to the obstruction of justice uh, statute, uh, we don't believe that there has been um, believable evidence to meet all the, all of the elements of obstruction of justice. Can you give me those five factors again? Yes. Uh, he removed Michelle's pants, lied to a 911 dispatcher about performing CPR, drained the tub, lied about the position of Michelle's body in the tub to medical examiner and law enforcement, and five, disposed of remaining drugs prescribed to Michelle following the surgery. Thank you. The obstruction of justice statute states, it's 76-8-306, that an actor commits obstruction uh, of justice if the actor with the intent to hinder, delay, or prevent the investigation, apprehension, prosecution, conviction, or punishment of any person regarding conduct that constitutes a criminal offense does one of the following. I think that there are only two sections that, that would be applicable in this case, which I think are C and I. And and so C would be alters, destroys, conceals, or removes any item or other thing. In order for that, to, well, and then I would be provides false information regarding a suspect, a witness, the conduct constituting an offense, or any other material aspect of the investigation. 
both C and I must be considered in light of subsection 1, uh, which is a section which they, they modify and follow. And that requires that there be uh, a prima facie case uh, with credible evidence uh, that, that uh, conduct was done to prevent an investigation, uh, apprehension, prosecution, <coughs> conviction, or punishment, uh, or to hinder or delay. In this particular case, the evidence is, has been undisputed that, that there was no investigation uh, conducted on April 11th of, of 2007. The officers... Wouldn't that be true of, I mean, taken to its logical conclusion then, no person could ever obstruct justice until an investigation had commenced. Is that your, your position? Or, or, or could a person commit a crime, know that he has done that, do all kinds of things to obstruct future prosecution and not violate the statute because the police don't know about it yet. Um, yes, I think that the obstruction of justice charge is different. Utah also has a tampering with evidence statute. And, and the, I should have brought a copy of that too, but the tampering with evidence statute is worded differently than the obstruction of justice statute. Uh, in tampering with evidence, it, it, it says something along the lines that uh, knowing that uh, there is an investigation or believing that one is about to be instituted, uh, something along those lines. The obstruction of justice statute is, is different. Uh, the, the language of this statute, I think, presumes uh, knowledge of an investigation. And it, conduct. it sounds like the tampering statute would suggest that when the legislature wanted to impose a knowledge requirement, it did, and it didn't impose one for obstruction. Well, and for obstruction, it actually used uh, intent. Yeah, right. And, and so I th and intent, I, I, I think, is, is even higher than, I see than, what you're than saying. knowledge that uh, for obstruction to legislature, I believe, particularly when you compare it with the tampering with evidence statute, uh, implies that there be knowledge of an investigation and intent to hinder, delay, or prevent the investigation from proceeding. Okay. And in this particular case, uh, Officer Smith um, uh, indicated that, that uh, on that day there was uh, uh, no suspicion. The, um, the medical examiner uh, is not a law enforcement agency. Uh, certainly they're an appendage of the state of Utah, but I don't believe that uh, a medical examiner's investigation uh, fairly can apply to the, the language of the obstruction of justice standard and, and to, to extend an investigation to, to include a administrative agency of, of the state to, to be an investigation that would be subject to the obstruction of justice statute, I think would, would be an overly broad reading of, of the statute and, and not provide fair warning and, and be constitutionally infirm. And, and in this case, the, um, the evidence that uh, was um, allegedly altered, destroyed, or concealed was, there's been no dispute that it was present when the police officers were in the house. They took pictures of the medication. Had they desired to seize it, they obviously could have done it. The police officers remained in the house after Mr. McNeil went to the hospital. The other evidence that Alexis and Rachel brought up about being found either in the laundry room or in the garage was there. there there's not evidence that, that it was actually removed from the house, moved from one place to another, perhaps, but removed such that it would have prevented police officers from, from coming back and seizing it is not the case. The prescription medication, uh, there certainly is testimony from Eileen Hang that that, that was uh, subsequently 
flushed down the toilet. It wasn't, however, flushed down the toilet until after it had been counted. That doesn't support uh, the notion that, that that medication was disposed uh, with the intent to, to hinder, delay, or prevent uh, a non-existing investigation from, from going forward. And particularly in light of the fact that the police officers could have seized that medication earlier in the day if it was relevant to, a, to an investigation. Um, in relation to um, uh, drain, draining the water from the tub, as, as I suppose the state uh, could argue that that is, is something that is, um, I, I don't think that that, that is a, a, a fair um, um, conclusion to say that draining the water from a bathtub would be altering uh, evidence such that it would hinder, delay, or prevent an investigation. But even if, even if Your Honor were to go to that extent, the state has two theories in this case in relation to the homicide charge. Uh, one theory is that uh, Mr. McNeil allegedly gave Michelle medication such that it caused her to have an arrhythmia and die. Uh, the water in the bathtub would, would have no bearing on an investigation under that aspect of the state's theory at all. The other aspect of the state's theory, uh, pursuant to Dr. Perper, is that Michelle died by drowning. And, and so if Your Honor were to, to consider draining water in the bathtub as, as an alteration that could hinder, delay, or prevent an investigation, which I think is, is an overly broad stretch, but even if, if you did, that could only potentially apply to, to a, a drowning aspect of a, of a hybrid theory of the state. And I, I don't believe that that's workable in this case. The state is seeking a jury instruction that, that allows the jury to not be unanimous on, on exactly what the cause of death was. And so how could you possibly instruct the, the jury in this case that uh, if you if you think that Michelle drowned, then you can consider obstruction of justice for draining the bathtub. But if you think that she died of an arrhythmia, you can't. It, it creates, I, I submit, an, an unworkable scenario in light of the multiple theories of the state to consider draining the water from the tub as, as a basis for obstruction of justice if Your Honor were to extend that language at all. To, to hindering, delaying, or preventing an investigation. In relation to the allegation that, that Mr. McNeil removed Michelle's pants, uh, I don't believe that the trial has um, uh, led to any evidence, any credible or believable evidence to support that, that that's the case. And, and so we'd, we'd submit that that uh, uh, should not be considered as, as a basis to support the obstruction charge. The, um, the next two items that the state uh, alleged in their probable cause statement and bill of particulars uh, were, were items uh, two and four, uh, which would be applicable under subsection I uh, in relation to uh, allegedly providing false information. Um, if we were to, well, the, the testimony at trial about number two is, is allegedly lying to a 911 dispatcher about performing CPR. Uh, I don't believe that the, that the testimony at trial has, has supported that by any believable evidence that that's the case. Doug Daniels uh, testified that, uh, uh, that, that Mr. McNeil was, appeared to be attempting to push on Michelle's chest. Uh, Doug Daniels, uh, Christy Daniels, and Angie Aguilar testified that he appeared to be giving her puffs of air when they arrived. Uh, obviously, from evidence that's been established, if someone's on the phone, they, they can't be doing CPR at the same time. The 911 dispatcher, Heidi Johnson, testified that she was trying to keep Mr. McNeil on the phone. He, he hung up on her 
twice and, and then on the county dispatcher once, the evidence that's been adduced at trial is, is, is actually in opposite of, of the state's theory that, that Mr. McNeil hung up on the 911 dispatchers when he could not perform CPR in an effort to do it. And so I, I'd submit that, that the allegation of lying to the 911 dispatcher does, doesn't support obstruction at all. And, and even if it did, uh, that would not be something uh, that I believe could fairly be deemed to be done with the intent of hindering, delaying, or preventing an investigation. Whether he said that or not, whether it was true or not, it wouldn't hinder, delay, or prevent an investigation. Then the, the last comment is, is lying about the position of Michelle's body in the tub. The evidence that's been presented at, at trial uh, in this case does not support that assertion. Uh, Ada McNeil in her Children's Justice Center interview uh, does not say the, the position of Michelle's body in the tub. The Danielses and Angie Aguilar uh, did not did not see Michelle in the tub until after Mr. McNeil had the opportunity to lift Michelle's head out of the water and, and turn her over. And, and so I submit that there's absolutely no credible evidence that's been presented in this case, or believable evidence to support that, uh, that he lied about the position of Michelle's body in the tub. And even if there were, such an allegation cannot be fairly considered to say that it, it would intentionally hinder, delay, or prevent an investigation. They, they could continue with their investigation regardless of what the position of the body was in the tub. If, if that information <clears throat> was incorrect, either to the 911 officer or to, to um, law enforcement about the position of the tub, you know, it would be more akin to potentially giving false information to a police officer, which is a separate uh, criminal statute, and and would not be akin to to giving false information that would hinder, delay, or prevent an investigation. And so, Your Honor, in relation to the obstruction of justice charge, I believe that our motion for a directed verdict is is supported by uh, the evidence that has been presented in the case. And, and this isn't a, a scenario where reasonable inferences uh, should or could be made to, to defeat the motion for the directed verdict. We also wish to, to make a motion for a directed verdict on the homicide case. Uh, in relation to the homicide case, uh, I, I would concede that our, under the standard for a directed verdict that our arguments are, are not as strong as they are in relation to the obstruction of justice statute, although I, st I still believe that there is a basis for the motion. Um, the, this, the directed verdict standard requires that there be believable evidence. And in this particular case, uh, I would submit that any evidence from which reasonable inferences could be made that a homicide occurred in this case is not believable evidence and therefore we would submit that your honor should grant our motion in relation to that charge as well are there any issues that i i could address for the court that i, that I haven't? don't think so thank you from the state your honor i'm, I'm going to uh respond as best I can without giving my closing argument. Okay. With respect to the homicide count, uh, the, mur the murder count, uh, Mr. Spencer talks about reasonable inferences. We are going to be asking the, uh, the jury to find reasonable inferences with respect to a number of facts which support the murder charge. But in addition to that, we have direct evidence here. We have direct evidence from inmate number one that the defendant told him he killed his wife. And he talked about how he did it uh, in drugging her up, getting her into the bathtub, holding her hand up under the water, and helping her out was what that testimony is. Can I ask, ask this? Is this a depraved indifference case? I, I'll address that, Your Honor. Yeah, the, the first prong is certainly 
met with the defendant intentionally or knowingly causing the death of Michelle. Right. There's believable evidence there. Second one, the defendant intended to cause serious bodily injury to Michelle and committed an act clearly dangerous to human life that caused the death of Michelle. Um, we have evidence that he drugged her up, that he got her into the bathtub. We have evidence about what those drugs um, together, the combined effect, would have been on a woman in her situation. And it's up for the jury to really decide on exactly what they believe as far as how far the defendant went or did not go with respect to admissions he made and the facts that we're presenting. Uh, Mr. Uh, in, excuse me, inmate number two did not testify directly that the defendant said that uh, he killed his wife, but testified that they couldn't prove it because the drugs were all prescribed. So like, there, there wasn't a, a additional testimony about him admitting to having pushed her under the water. But he clearly, in administering drugs to her, that potent cocktail of drugs creates a circumstance where uh, it's, it's quite clear that he's intending to cause serial, serious bodily injury to her, harm to her, put her at grave risk of death. Um, on the depraved indifference, Your Honor, um, the, court, uh, the state has submitted an instruction and to act with depraved indifference the actor must do more than act recklessly however he does not have to have a conscious desire to cause death nor does he need to, need to be aware that the conduct is reasonably certain to cause death and that's I guess that's my question has it ever been the state's theory that this was anything other than an intentional killing uh, we believe this was an intentional killing we believe it was a calculated effort on his part mm -hmm. to carry this out but at the end of the day, it's for the jury to decide what they believe the evidence has, has proved. And they can believe parts of the evidence. They don't have to believe all of the evidence. And they can come up with their conclusions. Well, are you going to be arguing depraved indifference? We're going to be arguing intentional killing. Uh -huh. But that the facts also support the two other prongs of murder. OK. And help me with that on the depraved indifference side. If, if this is not an intentional act, what, what well, conduct was highly likely to cause death? That, I mean, I, it, I'm just saying, if, if, this, if the state's going to argue this is a conscious, intentional act that well, caused the death of Michelle, then do we need to instruct on depraved indifference, which doesn't require any of that? The jury may believe that this was an intentional act for him to load her up with drugs, mm -hmm. place her in the bathtub, and allow her to just nod off and go underneath the water. And if that's the case, that would be a clear indication of his depraved indifference towards Michelle. I see. So you, you're, you're thinking as the state is, the state argues that this is an intentional killing. This, the, the jury may not believe that. But they may find that uh, that this defendant acted under circumstances that manifested depraved indifference to human life, knew that the risks of death were grave, and nonetheless and nonetheless acted. I see. Is okay. That, is that? Yeah, that helps me. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we believe the elements on, on the murder are met. Um, with respect to, I want to go back just a little bit on this whole bill of particulars idea. We didn't file a bill of particulars, Your Honor. We objected to it. And in our objection, we referred counsel to the information, which did contain a probable cause statement. We also referred uh, counsel to the preliminary hearing, which we had a five-day preliminary hearing on. And Judge McVeigh denied requiring the state to submit a bill of particulars. So the idea that we are somehow handcuffed to what was in the probable cause statement, that the time the information was filed is not correct. Um, there's a number of other facts that would support the, uh, the theories and the possibilities under the obstruction of justice statute. Um, could, could you just begin with the question I posed to Mr. Spencer about whether or not a person needs to know that an investigation is, is pending? It's, it seems to me that th that wouldn't be a requirement that I think a person would probably have to reasonably expect one. Um, sure. 
uh, I, I agree with the court there. I mean, I think the, the simplest example would be if I go out and murder, if I go kill someone intentionally, dig a hole, put the body in the ground and cover it up, and no one ever finds out about it. Mm -hmm. I've still committed obstruction of justice because in my actions of hiding the body and burying it, I'm preventing an investigation. Well, and, and in the action of committing the crime, there's, there's created a reasonable expectation that a prosecution may happen at some point in the future. That, that's exactly right, Your Honor. I think in here, I think one of the, the biggest pieces of evidence, and, and, and we believe he, he, he staged the scene. We believe he, he made an act, you know, for example, uh, telling everyone that he was against Michelle having the surgery, why this surgery, when he's the one that was pushing for it. Um, telling 911 two times that he's performing CPR. The courts heard clear evidence that you really cannot perform CPR in a bathtub like where, where Michelle was found. Um, moving the body, uh, you know, the only person we've heard, we've heard <coughs> statements from others that the defendant said that she was found face down head into the water, legs sticking out. Uh, Mr. Spencer says, well, he lifted her head up and turned her over. There's no evidence of that. There's no testimony with respect to that. I think the clearest thing here th th that shows the defendant knew about an investigation, well, number one, officer, law enforcement officers arrived. There were rep reports that were generated. Medical examiner's office got involved. But if the court recalls on the afternoon of April 4th, um, from Rachel McNeil's testimony. April 11th. Excuse me. Okay. What did I say? The 4th. April 4th. I meant April 11th, 2007. Okay. Rachel indicated that the defendant said he was worried about an investigation when Knox would come at the door. He needed to get an autopsy done. He wanted that autopsy to be done urgently. Uh, the, why, the reason we perform aut autops autopsies, Your Honor, one of the biggest reasons is to report back to law enforcement as to the cause and manner of death of someone. Did that occur before or after the medications were destroyed? We believe afterward. The, the statement, I'm worried about an investigation? Yes, we believe, okay. because we believe the evidence was um, the defendant comes back from the hospital probably early that afternoon. Um, Eileen Hang shows up. Uh, Damien is there as well. There's the counting of the medication, the flushing of the medication. It's sometime later when Alexis arrives, and I believe Rachel even ar arrived after Alexis, later in the late afternoon, maybe even perhaps the early evening, and that statement is made that he's worried about an investigation. Um, the removal of the pants, uh, the jury has heard testimony from the CJC interview from Ada McNeil that her mother was fully clothed. She talked about the top, and then she said she had some kind of a, she believed it was a blue bottom. She didn't believe it was jeans, but it was something like that. Those are then gone. No one knows what happened to them. Um, again, this goes to the state's theory that he was staging the scene to make it look like an accident. She had undressed, removed her pants. She's on these medications. He was telling everybody he was worried about how uh, the, the medications here, what the effect they have had on her and that she falls into the tub. So there's a fact, Your Honor, to support the allegations of the obstruction of justice. And in fact, it's the state's belief that he in fact totally hindered and prevented an, an effective investigation, which postponed his apprehension and prosecution on this matter. Anything else? Not unless the court has questions, Your Honor. I don't. Anything further on the motion? <coughs> Briefly, on, <coughs> on depraved indifference, I, I believe that, that that shouldn't be included in, in the instructions and that at least in relation to that, the directed verdict should be granted. The state's theory under depraved indifference, as they just described it, would require the jury to believe 
a portion of inmate number one's testimony, but not all of inmate number one's testimony. That would and, be okay, right? Um, you can believe all of what a witness says or part or, not, or nothing. Cer certainly, um, uh, that, that is the jury instruction, but there's no, uh, there's no basis in the evidence in this case uh, from which a jury could believe inmate number one's story up to the point of, of Mr. McNeil allegedly uh, loading her up and putting her in the tub and then but then not pushing her, her head underwater. What, what, what basis from the evidence could the jury possibly conclude that his testimony is true up to that point, but then not true in relation to allegedly pushing her head underwater? And so in theory, your, your Honor's statement is correct, but based upon the evidence, it's, it's, it's not supported. And so it would be inviting the jury to, to speculate about matters that, that aren't supported in the evidence. The depraved indifference aspect of the, of the homicide charge should, should not be submitted. Uh, the state's theory, as they admitted, is, is that this was an intentional killing, and the jury should be instructed pursuant to, their, to the state's theory and not on confusing matters. Okay. In relation to the obstruction of justice, uh, I, I think uh, the line of cases, State v. Finlayson comes to mind and, and others that talk about uh, acts that, that are part of, of an offense not being uh, appropriate for a basis of a separate charge, such as in, in a sexual assault case. It's not appropriate. It's always going to involve a detention. A detention. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I think that much of what the state is, is alleging um, could be obstruction of justice is, is inherently in, involved in the acts that they are saying are part of, of a homicide and sh shouldn't be a basis for a separate charge. Uh, being worried about an investigation under the obstruction of justice statute is, is different than, as we discussed, under the tampering with evidence statute. Under a tampering with evidence statute, being worried about an investigation would have more significance because that statute has believing that an investigation is about to be instituted type language in it. Obstruction of justice does not. The, the language of the obstruction statute requires that actions be done with the intent to hinder, delay, or prevent, at least implicitly, a, a known investigation. And that wasn't the case here. In relation to Ada's comments in the interview, she also said she didn't know about the clothes on the bottom. She also said that they, they walked home from, from school. And, and so to, to take part of, of her statement about pants and, and then use that as a basis for an obstruction charge, I would submit, is also not a, believable evidence such to withstand the, a request for a directed verdict on, on the obstruction. I think, I, I think I've addressed everything else and so much, Your Honor. Okay. Is there any questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, why don't we plan to do jury instructions after 3 o'clock today or after we break today? Uh, that will give you t some time to get lunch. I'll take this under advisement and uh, rule at 1 o'clock. Court's in recess.